everybody, and welcome to The Warren Files. We are so excited to be relaunching this amazing platform that we have going. And again, or as always, if you guys watched last week, you know Chris McKinnell's here with me. And he's the co-founder of the Warren Foundation, for Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. I'm so used to cutting it short to Warren Foundation. Um, and I just wanted you to talk before we really get started on who founded the foundation with you, because you reminded me a couple weeks ago that you were the co-founder and why you guys founded it. Well, actually, I founded it with my grandmother, Lorraine Warren. And the reason I did that was after the first Conjuring film, I was helping her, um, you know, because she was getting emails from all over the world. And she couldn't keep up with the demand. She did her best. But uh, we realized we needed to expand our mission. Um, the New England Society for Psychic Research is a, a wonderful organization, but as I told my grand, grandmother, Graham, most of the world has never even heard of New England, uh, let alone the New England Society. So I would like to keep your name alive and expand it to a worldwide network of professionals and help them to, you know, continue your work and keep your, your, your work alive. She fell in love with that idea. And so uh, that's how we got started. That's that's how we were born. About God, when did Conjuring One come out? Uh, two, I, I, I've yeah, kind of lost track. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while, but I, we, we've been going for about six or seven years now. Okay, and um, I know the one thing you wanted to talk about was the purpose and the mission of the foundation. Right. Uh, it's important that uh, we always state that so people do understand what we're, what we're all about. Uh, number one is, of course, our clients. It's to serve the people who believe that they are being troubled by the paranormal. Now, most of the time, it is not paranormal. I will admit that. Uh, but even then, we're going to try and help those people to, to get the resources they need. Um, we're not going to do the therapy if that's what they need, but we're going to help them to get a, into therapy or medical exams or whatever they need. Because as far as uh, myself and you and all of our members, all of us, um, we're in this to help people. So it doesn't matter if it's paranormal or not. If you come to us and ask for help, we'll do what we can. Um then the second goal is to educate the public so that they are not hurting themselves and they're not uh, watching the silly programs on television or on YouTube. Because if you followed that stuff, you'd probably get yourself hurt badly, especially if you're somebody who's open to the paranormal, who's uh, got something negative going on. Um, that makes you open to negative energies, negative entities. And we don't want people to get hurt. So education, same thing my grandparents did with their college lectures and then going on television and everything. We, we've continued that as well. Uh, then the next one is pretty near and dear to my heart. And this is because <clears throat> of these TV shows and YouTube videos and everything else which is educating the next generation of uh, researchers. Uh, there's a wild west mentality right now. Everybody is chasing the clicks and the likes and the, the money, uh, really. And we don't charge to help anybody. Uh, I've been doing this for over 40 years now. Uh, started back in um, uh, 80, 1980. And uh, honestly, I've never made money doing this. This is that's not my mission. Um, but unfortunately, there are a lot of people motivated by that fame and by by fortune. And these are not the people you want coming into your home. Uh, the only reason I'm here today, doing these things online and and in on camera and television and everywhere else, we do it now, is because my grandparents are no longer there. And we need to continue to put the word out as to who we are and that we're, we are available to you. Also, I think it's important because 
One of the first things that I did when we started the foundation is write a code of ethics. Uh, it's very similar to the Hippocratic Oath with a lot of other additions based on uh, this field of study. And I would like to see this adopted by everybody in this field, at least everybody reputable. There, there are an awful lot of con men and a lot of uh, people who are in this for the wrong reasons. Um, one of our, um, one of the psychologists that we do work with that, that helps us from time to time has been writing a uh, paper on how the paranormal attracts many people who are broken and are um, psychologically very vulnerable. And that for them, I, I think, and my, my background's in, in psychology and therapy, um, they're, they're looking for something to fill them. They're looking for something uh, to fill a, a hole that religion doesn't fill. They're looking for answers. And I understand that. Don't get me wrong. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, let your, your cur curiosity drive you and, and follow your passions. Absolutely. But keep in mind that the, the focus should be on the people that you're trying to help. Um, so we're, we're trying to educate the next generation of uh, researchers. Uh, as I had mentioned to you earlier today, you know, all of the great discoveries are made by people. Um, and my friend Tom, uh, when, I, when I said this next thing, he, he thought I was, well, he kidded me uh, about comparing myself to Einstein, and I was not. Um, wh what I'm trying to say, though, is, you know, Einstein came up with his theory of relativity when he was young. And if the greatest, most intelligent man in the world did his best work when he was young and then chased this unified field theory for the rest of his life and never managed to come up with it. You know, how could somebody as limited as I am possibly uh, solve the mysteries of the universe at my age? I don't think I can. My, my focus right now is on helping young people to uh, start asking the right questions maybe and to give them the benefit of what I've learned so that they can then take that and move on even much further. Uh, just like I did with my grandparents, you know, what I, what I do is not what my grandparents did. Not, not, a, not remotely really. Um, their, their, their viewpoints were far different than mine. Um, my, my experiences have been, um, far more, um, worldly, than theirs. And I think that, uh, that that's expanded my awareness of how the paranormal manifests. And finally, and yeah, I know I'm talking a lot. I apologize. Uh, finally, our, our, our fourth goal is to serve the people who are sensitive, the psychics and the empaths who come to us. My grandmother used to do that one-on-one -on -one and We've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that come to us now. And with my background, I, I realized what we needed was a, was a support group. And now we've got two. We've got one in English and one in uh, Spanish. And eventually, I, I hope that we'll expand into other languages as well. Um, this is a, a safe zone, a safe place where people can learn how to protect themselves, maybe suppress their abilities if necessary, deal with their anxiety and their panic attacks, uh, or learn how to uh, help their abilities along, which is also very important. So that's it. Those are our goals. Perfect. And I, I had a question. I should have written it down because now I can't remember it. Um, so, and the one thing you had mentioned to me earlier is that you have been staying in the shadows all this time and kind of like just staying in the background. Why suddenly are you being a little bit more verbal about things? Well, you know, in the tw when I was in my 20s, I used to do the talk show circuit, uh, Geraldo and some in major cities, but nothing other, nothing really national other than God help me, Geraldo. Um, and I didn't like it. I didn't like the, the attention I was getting. Um, 
you know, I, I, I was in all of my grandparents' uh, first editions in their books. Um, and then I, because I didn't like it, I asked them not to include me in later editions. But um, when my grandmother, you know, she had been retired for years. But when we announced her retirement, then I, I had to come forward. Uh, otherwise, nobody would know how to find me and, and get help from us. So that's why I'm here now. And, and we're working on new things. You know, Heather, you and I are working on a series of books. Um, yep. And we're working on classes. And we've got other things in the wings that um, will help the the notoriety of the foundation. And it will also help us to fund the foundation. One of the things that I've set up is whatever I do, um, books, TV, whatever, uh, that money will go to the foundation. It doesn't go to me uh, because I think it's really important that we keep the work going. And it's funny, we're doing so much work behind the scenes that it looks like we're not getting caught up. And once everything falls into place, it's going to be like we're just going to be throwing so much out there. So, <laughs> right. And, you know, for everyone else who's watching this evening, I'm going to say something important. Heather is a godsend. She is amazing. She has done so much to increase our presence online. Uh, the work she's doing on these books is extraordinary. Uh, the work she's doing in promoting us, unbelievable. She ha she is honestly a gift from God. Again, you're making me blush, but thank you. <laughs> and it's all deserved. It's like, Absolutely it's deserved. Great. Thank you so much. And, and like I told you guys last week, I really enjoy being a part of the foundation. And I've learned so much more in just the short time I've been a part of it than I ever did in the 30 years of research I've been doing. So it's a, a very good group to be a part of. So um, I just remembered my question. And okay. um, the one thing was, is I see a lot of paranormal groups out there that like to try to claim territory. This is my location to investigate. No one else can get in here. This is my territory. You know, no team else, no other team can come in. What are your thoughts on sharing information and versus not sharing information? It's, it's right in the name of, of our group, the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. We're a foundation, a research foundation. Um, scientists share their research. I, I have had, we, the foundation has had a lot of members who did not want to share their casework. Um, and I've never understood that at all. Why are you out there doing this if it isn't, to help people, if it isn't to to further our understanding of what we're dealing with. I mean, what good is you're going on a bunch of cases, gathering a bunch of information that you never share? I'm not trying to use it, you know, to to monetize it or to 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 take away credit from somebody. Yeah. I, if if we talk about a case and it's not our case, we say so. You know, um, but I'm not a fan of this movement of paranormal unity at all. Um, I don't believe in it. Uh, if you are a good researcher, I'm going to support you. Absolutely. No doubt. I, I don't care if you're part of the foundation or not. Um, but just because you say you're in the paranormal doesn't mean I need to support you. If you're not doing good for some, for families, if you're not out there helping people, I'm not going to support that. That's, that's like a hobbyist who says, gee, I want to be a surgeon. I'm going to get a, a scalpel and start cutting people's heads open. You know, learn first, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that actually brings me to another point because um, from all the research I've done and coming from a couple of different teams in the past is my goal with the field is to come up with, with a almost like a scientific method for paranormal research that is used by every team that includes how we do the investigation, how we collect the, you know, evidence, how we preserve the evidence. And um, 
So the foundation, we have special ways to do that too, including the different type of data we collect during the investigation. Did you want to share any specific stuff that researchers might not be thinking that they need to collect that they really should be collecting? Well, first, let me uh, go back to what you said about a scientific uh, <laughs> method, because we tried to do that in psychology, and that's behaviorism. Mm -hmm. yep. um, you know, we, we tried to take the mind out of psychology and you, you really can't and you can't you certainly can't do that with the paranormal. Um, science is a wonderful tool, but if it's the only tool in your toolbox, then you're going to fall short right now because we do not have the scientific theories to uh, ex to express the phenomena that we see. We can't replicate the phenomena that we see. Uh, in experiments. So science is, is a very limited tool in this regard. Um, we, we have to be more interactive with our clients and we have to gather lots of information. Unfortunately, that means we get invasive. Um, it can't just be about the phenomena that they are experiencing. We need to understand the people because there's always that underlying reason why they're vulnerable and not their neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand that. Um, and that means medical data, psychological data, real embarrassing data um, at times. You know, um, for instance, uh, domestic abuse, mental illness, um, drug abuse, a big one, real big one, really. And just because a person is using drugs or is schizophrenic doesn't mean that there isn't paranormal phenomena going on. But it certainly gives us something else that we also have to take into consideration. And I think that's important for our team, for any team to understand. Um, often I think that they're embarrassed and they, they don't want to ask those deep, hard questions. You're going to have to also accept that your clients are going to lie to you often because they're, they're embarrassed or afraid or, you know, afraid they're going to be judged, afraid that uh, you're just going to think it's psychological and you're going to walk away. Um, and it's not the case. Not at all. Oh. My last you, question, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've got we've gone through a whole bunch of questions already. You've answered almost everything that I had written down. Um, another question I have is when we help others, how do we exactly help other researchers? How do we help other researchers? You mean researchers who are not part of the foundation? Right. How can you know how can people on come occasion, to us for help? On occasion, well, if a team that's not part of the foundation comes to us and asks for help, we'll get, guide them if we can. Um, but we will not bring teams who are not part of the foundation into our cases. Um, the reason for that is we vet all of our members. We make sure that they're good. And we don't, we don't always get it right. I'll be the first to admit it. Uh, I've sadly gotten rid of several people because they put on a good face and then it turns out that they're only in it for the Warren name and for notoriety uh, and they don't have the ethics and we will get rid of people if that's the case because at the end of the day this is about the people we serve it's not about us okay, so that actually Go ahead. I was going to say, that brings me to a question that Jeff asked earlier. He wants to know if we have a network of vetted teams throughout the country. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and it, we've also learned to get away from the, the, the teams. Uh, we'll bring in individuals, and if 10 of them all belong to the same team, that's fine. But that doesn't mean we're going to use them as a team. Uh, we will take the people we need for a case. Um, it's, it's great that people have a team and I, I don't begrudge them that that's not a problem for us, but I, I have discovered that when your loyalty is to your team and not the foundation, if one person leaves, then they all can leave. And we don't want that. 
You know, we want to keep the good quality people that we have. Uh, we, because without them, we can't help people. So uh, we, we concentrate more on helping raise up each of our individual researchers. Yeah, and I know we have an extensive way to vet them through application process and everything. And there were a few people in the comments who are asking how to go about joining. So if you check the comments, I did post a link that will take you to a Google form, fill that out, and we will get back to you with additional information on how to join. There's something really important there I, I want to bring up because it, it's a sticking point that's come up for years. Um, we ask for references. And people say, oh, but we, we, we protect the anonymity of our clients. So do we. But when you're talking, if we were doctors, we would share our cases with one another because that's how you help one another. And without references, we have no way of knowing if you are who you are presenting yourself to be. We need to talk to those clients and see what they say about the way you've worked and, and make sure that you, you've been good. Um, we're not going to use that information to uh, publicize it. One of, the, one of the hard lessons I learned from my grandparents, and it's because I didn't agree with them, is uh, that they did publicize their cases. And I saw the damage that that had done. I mean, horrifying damage. I remember one case I was in, in uh, Tewksbury, Massachusetts. And the very first night I showed up, now this wasn't my grandparents' fault. Um, somehow the, the woman of the house had contacted the local police about what was going on in the house. And the police had written it up on the police blotter and a reporter had gotten a hold of it. And when we arrived with my, my team, there were hundreds and hundreds of cars in this little neighborhood. And as we're walking to the front door, we're being you know, hordes of people are just coming and begging to come into the house. Like, what the heck is going on? And the police became very upset with this family. And it really made things much harder. It was a bad poltergeist case. So we never publicize uh, the personal details of our cases. As a matter of fact, um, if, and, and this, Heather, you can probably speak, I know you can speak to this. Um, sometimes we do get uh, people who come to us because they want us to validate their case publicly so that they can promote it because they want to make a fortune off of it. Now, I don't have a problem if they want to go public after we're done, but don't do it while we're working with you because now is about healing and it shouldn't be about promoting yourself. You know, you're not, you're not going to see us uh, go public on our cases. Yeah, no, that's the one thing I always tell people and you can tell when someone wants the war and name attached to something just right off the bat. Yeah. No. Here, here's my video. Uh, what do you think? Is this it? I'll have my cameraman send you more evidence. Uh, can you come to the house and check it out? It's the most haunted house in Australia. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> you don't want me to fix it. You you just want me to be there so you can say that we were there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm just going to scroll through the comments real quick. Was there anything else you wanted to add before we started taking questions? Oh, I, I think I covered it. everything you I talked about. the questions. I love that. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, I think what's important for me is to reiterate, um, please have some ethical standards. If you're not there to help, don't be there at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you may be there only to help the ghost that's stuck there, and that's fine. Um, but... Don't don't just do it to, to get your clicks and likes. And certainly don't expose the family to something that could really cause them harm. Uh, one of the things I've seen in all of these these TV shows is they go in, they stir things up and then they leave. And that's when we get the call, you know, oh, go, ghost, somebody was here and now it's worse. Please help us. And 
of course will help. But you shouldn't have to be begging television shows for help. We, we hope, you know, we can expand our presence online so you know to get help from us. And oh, there's one other thing. This isn't magic, um, regardless of how many magic users I have on staff. Um, the truth is, uh, there is no magic wand we're going to wave and make this all go away. This is something we do with you, the client. Uh, it's not something we do for you. And we, we need your active participation for this to work. It's something I learned with my grandparents. Um, their, their success rate was maybe 50%. And that was because, you know, you didn't have the cooperation of the family. They didn't understand that they needed to, to put some skin in the game. <laughs> And one question that I lost from my feed, because my feed only shows so many questions, mm -hmm. was um, at what age did you start? And what was the scariest case you've ever been involved in? Okay. Um, I started at 16 on my very first case. Um, I'd been exposed, of course, much earlier. Um, I think the first time I saw my grandmother use her abilities was when I was 14. We were um, out in Ohio and I, I had gotten to meet one of the three exorcists who had worked on the the original exorcist case. I mean, we're talking the real case, not the movie. Um, and then a day or two later, we were on, I don't know if it was Inside Edition, PM Magazine, one of these. Um, and they brought us to a house that we were not allowed to go into and my grandparents had no idea where they were being taken and my grandmother stood outside and talked about this house while the local reporter is showing me his notes and she's reading off or i mean she's talking about um this apparition of a big heavy man with a but a bloody butcher's apron who came into the house, the stench of rotting flesh that came from underneath the sink. And, and it's in his notes. I was like, wow, my grandmother's a superhero, you know? So that was uh, extraordinary. The most terrifying case. Well, for me personally was my first case when I was 16 uh, because after that case, after that night of absolute horror, I went from being someone who was terrified of everything and couldn't sleep without a light on to sleeping in the dark, uh, never worrying about the cases again because I had faced my fears. If there's one thing that I can teach the world, it would be to, to face your fears. Not fight your fears. Fighting your fears, you'll fight forever. But immerse yourself in what it is that makes you afraid. If you're afraid of cats, go to one of those restaurants that has a thousand cats in it. Or go to a cat rescue uh, sanctuary and sit with them. You know, don't fight them. Just sit with them. Be with them. You know, if, if you're afraid of spiders, go someplace where you can play with tarantulas. You know, learn to overcome your fear to let it go and it'll free you. And that's what happened with me. Now, there, there were certainly worse cases. Maurice Theriel is always one that I bring up because because the man died and he died because at the at point at that point in our in our understanding and I was still in college we didn't understand the link between psychology and the paranormal and these underlying problems that need to be addressed. And with his horrible, horrible uh, history of abuse as a child and then the abuse he put on others, we didn't do anything about that afterward. And um, eventually he came under possession again and he died. So uh, that's certainly the one that's had the most impact on how I approach this work.
how to protect yourself. Okay, let me uh, first say, Jake, um, we mentor. We do mentor uh, new people. Um, if you've got the right mindset, if you're the right fit for the foundation, um, and if we have people near you, then we're happy to mentor. Um, I hesitate to give quick advice about things uh, for cases because a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And if you get that and you think, oh, okay, great. Now I can go in on a case, that, that's an issue. Um, but you need to have faith, faith in anything. I, I don't care if it's in Krishna or uh, Dambala, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It's faith because God by any other name is still God. Um, it's just how you manifest your faith that matters. Which raises some interesting questions about if that's the case, if faith is all that matters, then what are you really dealing with? Um, one, of the, one of the things I've learned is that I don't know. Uh, the, the more I've learned, the less I, I, I know the more questions I have. And I'm content now to, to ignorantly uh, go into this world because, you know, I'm, I'm a man with a candle in a very, very, very large dark room. And uh, all I can illuminate is what's around me. And I, I just hope that that's enough to help the people that I'm trying to serve. Yeah, and... Um... Okay, sorry, someone just messaged me saying my audio wasn't working, but it was I was on mute. Um, before we continue with some of the questions, it's been brought to my attention from a few people who are helping me monitor the comments because they're going so fast. Um, I want to set the record straight that we are not the same foundation as Nesper because some people are saying that Tony Spira founded our foundation, not you, and that Ed and Lorraine Warren did not have a son, and you're their grandson. <laughs> So right. I want to make sure we get that. Yeah, before. Nesper Nesper is local. Nesper is uh, not international. Uh, I've been in the world. Uh, well, I started with the peace. Well, actually, I started with my grandparents in England and Scotland and Wales uh, when I was 21. And then uh, when I was 22, I was in the Peace Corps in Africa, studying, uh, learning about animism and uh, magic there and how things presented themselves there. And then I, I was traveling all over the world. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm Ed and Lorraine's grandson. Uh, Tony is their son-in-law. Um, he helped with their lectures and everything else. Um, he's my stepdad uh, and he runs Nesper. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure because Stephen actually commented on it because he was messaging, messaging me, asking me the questions to make sure we got the correct information out there. And um, yeah, there is so, some confusion. Here. Yeah, they're yeah. family. They're my family, yeah. but um, they they're running a different organization. Their their organization is um, far more media oriented. And then. I don't know if you would have this answer, but I get asked this a lot when people find out I'm part of the foundation. Is Amity really haunted or was it a hoax? Oh, it's real. Absolutely. 100% real. My grandparents felt it was the worst case they ever worked. Um, I don't care. I really don't care uh, uh, if people believe that or not. But I, I met the Lutzes and I know they believed it. They didn't make any money on the movies. They didn't make any money on the book um, at all. And they left everything behind. The only thing they asked my grandfather for uh, when they met my grandparents. And my grandparents were not invited in by the Lutzes. Um, they were actually brought in by Channel 5 News in New York City. Um, because the news had broken that there's this haunted house and my grandparents were fairly well known by then. And um, they had to go to Kathy Lutz's mother's house to get the keys because the Lutzes were too afraid to go back to the house. And George said, the only thing I want out of that house is the deed so I can sell it. And they gave away 
everything else. They gave away their gun collection, their antique uh, coin collection, worth thousands and thousands of dollars. All of the, the clothing and furniture, food, everything. They, they wanted nothing out of that house. And they were bothered for years afterward. Leaving that house was not enough. There was already a spiritual attachment. Is it more important to study the people tortured by the paranormal than study the paranormal itself? I don't want to study the people. I want to help the people. Um, that's a little different uh, approach that I think I have. I, I, and I know my people, the people that work with me, they're the same way. You know, they're all about the people we serve. Um, <clears throat> But it is important to understand them and to have empathy for them as well. But you, you have to maintain your professionalism. You can't get too close um, and you can't overshare with them. Um, one of the things that drives me nuts is when people go in and the psychic says something like, oh, you've got a demon attached to you and it's been with you since you were a child and it's trying to kill you and it's after your, your infant child now and holy crap. You know, can we please have some evidence before you, you spring that on a family? And even if it turns out you've got evidence, can we maybe work on minimizing their fear so that they're not feeding this thing? and then work on getting rid of it. You know, you don't have to explain everything in detail to them. You give them the information they need to empower them, to help them, not to terrify them. Um, somebody was asking about the difference between a panic attack and a psychic attack. I was trying to find that question again, but I've lost it in my feed. Yeah, that, that was Nicole. Um, now, empaths and th this is actually why the, the the psychic support group got started is because i had i had discovered that um empaths were being overwhelmed and they were suffering from panic attacks and anxiety attacks and it's because they pick up so much energy throughout the day from others and i've got a dear friend up in uh, canada who she's extremely gifted but that also means she, she's somewhat agoraphobic and easily overwhelmed by, by the people she works with. Even though, you know, she's respected and liked, um, she absorbs all of their problems and it really hurts her. So we've, we work on things like psychic grounding and how to do that um, and how to set um, bubbles of protection around you. Uh, so that you can ward off that energy. Um, I, th I think that this is an important thing for people. And, and, and the truth is, psychic grounding uh, has been shown scientifically to also work with um, people who suffer from depression and anxiety attacks. It's grounding. It, it's um, that visualization going out in your bare feet. There is, a, there is an exchange of ionic energy with the, with the earth. And... That's been proven scientifically. And when you use visualization with it, that's quantum physics at work. Um, that's shaping your local reality and helping to get rid of that energy that's weighing you down and then replenishing yourself with the, the Earth's energy. It's very, very, very healthy. And one question is, what special gifts, if any, did you inherit from your grandmother? You know, uh, I, I am a psychic. Uh, I'm not comfortable with it. I admit that. Um, I used to read auras, but I used to scare the hell out of people doing that. Uh, you know, it, some stranger starts telling you intimate secrets about yourself. They, they run screaming, literally have run screaming away from me or, or friends that I, you know, had friendships with at college and all of a sudden I'm telling them things I should not know because they asked me to because they thought it was a game. And uh, no, 
by the time I was 26, I had seen a man with a black aura, and I knew he was going to die. I couldn't say anything. You know, I didn't know how he was going to die. Was he going to be hit by a car? Was he going to have a heart attack? Well, next morning he had a heart attack, and he died. But what could I have done to prevent that, mm -hmm. honestly? Um, so I kind of suppressed those abilities and I've only ever used them for work. Now, people will often ask me when I go on a case, um, and that's the only time I open myself up. Uh, they'll, they'll say, well, what do you get from me? So I'll put my hand on their shoulder or I'll hold their hand or something and I'll, I'll get a general impression. Yeah. You know. But I'm not going to delve because that's an invasion of privacy. Uh, as for the gifts themselves, you know, I don't like labels. It's one of the things uh, I learned in college is this idea of labeling, um, that human beings have this need to put things in boxes because it makes them feel safe and secure. Uh, if they can't label it, then it's a mystery and mysteries are, are scary. And, and can hurt you. I, I'm on, I'm somebody who embraces what I don't know and likes that. Um, I'm sensitive. I can use my abilities in a lot of different ways. I've used them for mediumship. I, I've had spirits channel through me. Um, I've done psychometry, which is picking up an object and feeling the energy from it. Um, you know, and of course, uh, just simple clairvoyance. Um, I've had, um, uh, what is it called again? You know, when you can smell things psychically. Um, that one. Oh, clairsentient. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but again, it's labels. I'll do what I need to do on a case. And if I can, great. If I can't, great. I don't ever trust what I feel. I have to find validation. I have to find evidence to back it up before I'll believe anything that I say. For instance, I was in a house uh, two weekends ago on a Friday. <clears throat> I was in three houses that night. And um, in the third one, I walked in and the woman was afraid that she had been cursed because she had tried to go to a magic user to bring her uh, husband back to her who had left her. There was nothing there. But when I got into her house and I'm walking around, I got into her uh, kitchen. I was like, oh, my God, this is heavy energy. This is this is sad. This is awful. And I asked her about that. And she said, that's where I go to hide and cry from the children so they don't see me. And that's that's what I was picking up on. That's exactly what I thought I was picking up on. Um, but I wasn't going to share that until I got, you know, some validation from her because now this is true for anybody, but it's especially true because of my family. You know, when you say something, it carries weight. When you say you're a psychic investigator or you're a psychic, and you tell somebody, oh, a Lilith de demon is attached to you. Well, that person's really going to believe it. And then they can start to manifest it, even if it's not really there. Or at least manifest problems and start blaming everything on this manufactured Lilith demon. So I'm very, very careful about what I share. Because I don't want to share anything that can negatively shape a family. Are you worldwide? Of course. We have, we have people um, on every continent right now. Uh, well, except Antarctica. Uh, and not, not tremendous uh, coverage yet. We certainly need more. Um, God knows. Uh, for instance, we've got uh, a case in London. And unfortunately, we only have... Well, really, the closest person is three hours away. And the next closest is five or six hours away. So we, we definitely need to expand. But we are incredibly careful 
about who joins the foundation. Um, this should only be professionals. This should only be people who are in this for the right reasons. And then that brings up the next question that just popped up. Could clients vet investigators who claim to have been trained by the warrants with the group? I'm sorry? She wants to know if clients can vet our investigators who claim to have been trained by the warrants. Yeah, they should contact us first because I, I have seen people online claiming that they were uh, part of the foundation or trained by the warrants. And I don't know who they are. They're certainly not part of us. Now, having said that, my grandparents also uh, trained a lot of people over the years. Now, these are people who would come and go quickly. Um, they had a lot of, you know, a lot of college kids over the years, a lot of them. And I never really got to know most of them because they didn't last long. So they may say that they're trained by Ed and Lorraine Warren, but in reality how much and even if they were trained by my grandparents um my again my grandparents uh dealt in a different time and it, with with less understanding you have to remember i had the benefit of their knowledge they didn't have the benefit of anybody else's you know they were reading my grandfather was reading old books written in the 40s 50s 60s or even much much earlier um and that information today wouldn't stand up. Okay. And then real quick before I get to the next question, I see a couple of people asking where the Google Forms are again. I will post them again towards the end. And we'll also have them posted on our Facebook page for you guys to get to. Because I, I know there's hundreds of comments and they, they probably got buried. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I don't know. <laughs> so don't ask me, please. <laughs> Okay. I, I, I'm good with people. I'm not so great with technology. <laughs> and um, do you think spirits will sometimes randomly find an empath or psychic person to have them check them out? I'm assuming she means the spirit out. She says yeah. she's had many experiences where she wakes up at night and sometimes can't sleep due to sleep paralysis. Absolutely. Absolutely true. You know, often... People will tell me, oh, you know, no matter where I go, they follow me, they're, they they haunt me. And no, that's not really the case. Um, more often than I, although sometimes there are spiritual attachments that do follow people, uh, more often than not, the reality is you're a psychic. And so wherever you go, you keep seeing spirits because they're attracted to you. Psychics, psychic auras burn more brightly than an ordinary person's whereas an ordinary person is a, a candle in the darkness um a psychic is a lighthouse and they they are burning bright and so they will attract these lost souls who are looking to pass along a message and if you're a psychic who doesn't know how to get that information uh then yeah it can be quite terrifying you don't know what you're dealing with that's one of our things is, is helping people to understand what they're dealing with, because more often than not, it's not actually a, something to be afraid of. It's just it's unknown for you. So that's scary. And then she wants to know why the Amityville House and Conjuring House no longer have activity, because she says that the current tenants say nothing happens. And I've heard <clears throat> mixed stories on this one. Um. I was on a podcast a couple of years ago uh, with a really nice guy. Um, and he keeps in touch with the reporter who went into Amityville with my grandparents. And she has followed the families in the Amityville house. And many of them have reported phenomena. And they don't last long. You know, that house turns over constantly. And remember, they've even moved the house. It's been moved to a, to a completely different location. But again, then we get back into the underlying conditions. Why does it affect one person and not another? You know, what is it about you that opens you up? Um, is it autism? Is it that you're psychic? Is, and by the way, autism is not a bad thing. It's just I have found that people who are autistic are incredibly gifted. 
often and um, therefore often very open to the spirit world. It's, it's not bad. It's just uh, the next step in our evolution, I think. And then um, there's a comment here on does smudging using sage help a person or protect your house? For about two and a half hours. That's about it. Um, you have to combine it with ritual that focuses your intention and your faith. Without those components, it is a short term uh, help. And then the next question is, is there a way to test yourself to see how strong of an empath or psychic you truly are? Absolutely. There are many ways. Uh, on the, the Warren Files YouTube channel, there's a great video by a friend of mine. Uh, he's, he's a medium. His name is George. And George the medium. And uh, <laughs> he helps in this one hour, I think it is, video. He talks about different ways to um, test yourself. For instance, um, have a friend give you an object that belongs to somebody they know and somebody they really know, and then see what you pick up. Don't be afraid to be wrong. You know, um, that's how you learn is by sharing. Now, the important thing also is when you do go into a place, if you're if you're a sensitive, go in ignorant, go in without knowing, because when you do know then that shapes what you're feeling. So don't do that. Mm -hmm. Let the other team members, let them all be prepared for that part. If you're the psychic, then you go in blind. And do not share your information with other psychics. Share it with the team leader only, preferably in writing. And then, or at least on, on, on film. And then afterward after they've gathered evidence and maybe talk to another psychic who happens to be in the group then you compare notes but only afterward because one of the things i've found is that psychics um are human and often when they're talking together they'll go down the rabbit hole and they'll be oh yeah i felt that too oh yeah and this and oh yeah and next thing you know it's a worldwide conspiracy of demonic entities that are holding on to a, a family of ghosts in, in the house and they're spreading out and they're eating babies and <laughs> okay anyway and, and like I always tell people before you tell the homeowner or the client that there's demons all around them Share it with your team lead first and, and have proof yeah. before you break that news to the client. <laughs> what is a demon? That, that's so many different definitions because everybody has so many different versions of the demons. So, yeah. And in my experience around the world, they are not the same as what the Western world wants to label them as. They're different everywhere. And historically, Historically, they're different as well. They've that image of a demon has shape has changed shape over the millennia. And when you label it, label again, then you give it form. And that's when it's a real problem. You help it to manifest. So in my in my experience, and I'm an exorcist. Uh, they're incredibly rare and uh, they're not, they don't have the wisdom of the ages. They can be very powerful and they can be deadly, uh, but they, they aren't what we think. So don't call it a demon to a family, please. <laughs> Oh, and yes, uh, Craig Porter, you should hear music. I'm playing classical music oh. in the background. <laughs> <clears throat> and then this is getting back to how we work the foundation. How do you pick who is best for a certain job? Well, first we find out more about the case. Um, we have an initial interview and we get information on what we're dealing with. 
And then if we feel that this is something where we need to get a psychological evaluation, we bring in a psychologist. If uh, it's medical, then we bring in our medical consultant. Um, if it's something that is psychic or magic, then we bring in those people. Um, and we always work through our, our regional directors and they work through our frontline people working together. Um, and we try to, we try to pick people who are going to work best mesh with that family. Um, sometimes it's a matter of expediency, but we, we do our best and we do as much as we can for them. And then how involved do you want your team members to be and how much history do they need to have? Uh, how do, how much do we want them to be involved with the family? With the foundation. Oh, like, well, least, that's why I'm assuming. <laughs> okay. Well, one of the, one of the things that uh, we try to find out is what other strengths do they bring to the table? I mean, not just as a investigator, but you know, are they good with social media like the wonderful Heather uh, or are they good at teaching or are they, what are they good at? You know, um, web design. Um, how can you help us to help others? And there are a million different ways that can be done. Um, we've got one young man that just started with us. Uh, he's 23 years old. He's a medium. He's exploring his abilities. And he's got the gr a great mindset. And he's, he's wanted to be a member for a couple of years now. And... You know, he, he, he went to school for journalism, so he's also got some writing talent. So, of course, we're going to use that if we can. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a volunteer organization. And it's up to the members to let us know what they're willing to do and what they're capable of doing. And then we're happy to bring them in. And then... Th Bouncing off of that one is someone also had asked, are there ways for people to help the organization that do it not involve field work? So like someone who doesn't oh, yeah. want to go on investigations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Gustavo uh, is our web designer. Never would go on a actual case, but he's also uh, a terrific uh, photographer, um, videographer. And um, he, he's a wonderful resource for us to help others. You don't have to go on cases to be a part of the foundation. Uh, like any organization, we need people who can fill other roles. Administrative, for instance. Yeah, <laughs> I know we can use help with that at times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, <clears throat> that would not be one of my strengths. <laughs> Uh, we're slowly organizing it. No. <laughs> yeah. Around me. Working around <laughs> me. Yes, I know. Exactly. I know. <laughs> and Rudy, I know we touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, hi, Rudy. He's actually a host of the Apocalypse Project, who we're interviewing with this weekend. And great oh, guy. Right. Um, <laughs> he wants to know, I know we touched on it earlier, but how exactly does psychology play a role in paranormal research? Oh, it's fundamental, absolutely fundamental. Um, you cannot divorce one from the other. Well, you can divorce psychology from the paranormal, but paranormal and psychology go together. Uh, you manifest what you believe. Uh, for instance, it, Oh, I hate that I can never remember this poor girl's name in, in Germany. It's the case of Emily Rose, that movie, but that's not her real name. Um, the real girl, um, when she would come under possession, she felt that it was by Hitler, Nero, and a demon. And she thought they were all demons. Uh and the one I always say is, you know, a Hindu family is never going to be uh, dealing with a Christian demon. They aren't. Uh, these things manifest according to your cultural and spiritual beliefs, according to your psychology. 
you're bringing to the table what manifests. So you have a, a, a tremendous amount of power. And when you understand that, then you take control over what's happening. Now, I've been attacked. I have been thrown. I, I know other um, exorcists who've been beaten so badly that you know, they've had broken bones because they've been thrown against walls. Um, it's extraordinary what can manifest, but is it a manifestation of a separate entity or something from within the person? I'm not saying it's not paranormal. Don't get me wrong. When you get thrown across the room and nobody touched you, that's paranormal. Um, and exorcism works. And yes, it was whispering in the background. It's just somebody, don't worry about it. It's nothing psychic. <laughs> um, folks, this is an important lesson for you. Never assume it's paranormal. Because when you assume it's all paranormal, then you're manifesting the paranormal. Uh, always assume it's natural. Assume it's squirrels running on the roof. Don't assume it's a gremlin running in the attic. Until you're overwhelmed by evidence, otherwise, assume it's natural. And when it's you're missing keys because, you know, for two hours you've been looking for them and there they are right exactly where you had left them the first two hours ago, don't assume it's the devil. It's a ghost. Almost certainly it's a ghost. Uh, it's the kind of thing they do so that they can say, look, I'm really here. Yeah, and yeah, I, the one thing I learned, I know I've talked about this before, is I've researched the paranormal for years, and it wasn't until about two years ago when I was actually physically attacked, and it, it opened my eyes to the whole other side of paranormal. <laughs> I saw um, I saw somebody earlier had asked a question about, has there been an increase uh, in cases and bad cases in the last few years. I get asked that question an awful lot, actually. For many years, I've been asked that question. <laughs> and the truth is, no, um, not at all. There was an uptick during uh, COVID because I think the spirit world was going a little crazy saying, what the hell's going on over there? You know, we're, we're all so anxious that we were throwing off so much energy and we were stirring things up. But no, uh, my grandfather had a wonderful way of putting it. Um, he was always asked, you know, well, how come we don't see these things? And his answer was, well, if you're going to hunt tigers, you got to go where tigers are. And a lot of these teams are seeing an uptick in, in negative cases simply because now they're going into a negative case and then another negative case. And then it starts to build. But that's them. That's not that the, the the world is getting more negative at all. Yeah, I always told people the uptick in cases with COVID was because people were actually home and noticing the activity. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and their anxieties. You know, they, they were throwing off a lot of negative energy. Yep. You, know, you, you stay home with your, your kids 24-7 for a year and a half. Hmm. It can be difficult. <laughs> okay. Do you have cases that will haunt you the rest of your life? Yes. Absolutely. I I care about people, of course. You know, there there's always going to be the cases that uh, you couldn't help for one reason or another. And the cases were maybe you tried to work within a structure and the structure moved too slowly and somebody died. Yeah, absolutely. This isn't a game. This isn't a hobby. And if you don't going to go into this understanding that not only are you putting yourself at risk, but the family that you're dealing with is at risk then you shouldn't do this. Yeah, the whole uh, it's, it's concept of paranormal tourism. 
Yeah. It's the difference between being a security guard and being a cop. Mm-hmm. How do you balance between different cultures? I embrace change. I embrace diversity. Um, I love it. I love learning. And one of the things I, I've learned is every single one of us is just a soul looking for God. Every single one of us, regardless of whether or not you believe in God or not, you're just a soul. And there's no difference between you and a guy in the Taliban. You know, they have their story. They, they have their path. It may not be your path. You may not understand it. You may fear it. But it doesn't mean they're not a soul and that they shouldn't be understood. Evil exists in this world to overcome. It's there to teach us compassion and love and to to fight against. Um, you, you have compassion for the sinner and you hate the sin. And you do everything you can. Sometimes all you can do is divorce yourself from that person who's hurting you. But don't carry the, the, the anger and the pain and the... And the the resentment because you're only hurting yourself let it go let it go it's a lesson to be learned today i had an amazing experience somebody i i i, I wish i remembered i i feel bad that i don't somebody from um, middle school contacted me and he he was saying something about we were friends and we had been in a, a parade together and in middle school, he and another friend of his beat me up and kicked me in the face when I was on the ground. I don't remember any of it at all. Um, and I, I told him, you know, please don't worry about it. The past is something you learn from. It's not something you carry with you. You learn the lesson and you move on. And without my past and all of the mistakes I made, believe me, I'm no saint at all. Um, None, none of us are, really. Um, even saints are, were not saints to begin with. We all, God help us, are so flawed that you, you learn your lesson and you keep going. I think one of the problems we have with um, these people we put on pedestals, like my grandparents, for instance, if if something negative comes out, then they fall from that perch. Instead of saying, well, wait a minute, they overcame those things and kept going. That's to be admired, but none of, nobody is a superhero. We're just people. I, I'm sorry. Am I rambling? <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> uh, somebody's asking... Uh, how do we link into the psychic and empath support group? Listen, this is this is only for psychics and empaths. Um, it is not a place to get readings or give readings or anything of that uh, nature. It is exactly what we say it is, a support group. Um, and I'm sure we've already posted the link and we'll post it again. Um, you have to answer three uh, questions. When you join, uh, you know, are you a psychic? Will you follow our rules? You know, what are your abilities? That kind of thing. Um, please answer those because we won't let you join if you don't. Yeah, and I'll make sure that those all get posted on our page as well as the videos. Because I know some people are watching from Paranormal United Network TV. So make sure you like us at Warren Legacy Foundation so you can <coughs> see all of that as well. Yeah, and also a shameless plug, uh, because God knows I hated doing these things, and we've got over 80 of them. Uh, the Warren Files YouTube channel. It's The Warren Files. Um, the, the quality of the sound and everything isn't great, I admit, but the information is wonderful. And at least I think so. Um, and uh, you'll learn a lot. Where's that question? There it is. Okay. What is your process for discerning psychological and paranormal? 
We gather an awful lot of information before we jump to conclusions. We don't prejudge. Um, that's important. You don't take a small amount of information and say, well, that's what it is. No. You're not doing a service to the family. Uh, you need to gather lots of information. Uh, this is not a one day and done type of thing. I haven't said that. I get lots of communications throughout the day. And yeah, I will give them some advice, some information and say, come back to me and let me know if this is effective. Nine times out of 10, it is. If it isn't, then we, we move forward with more. But if we can solve it right away by telling you how to spiritually cleanse your home, then we're going to do that. Um, and that, that's good enough. But uh, give tools and minimize fear and give, give understanding so that they, they, they understand. Um, but God, please minimize the fear. That's important too. No matter how bad it is. Uh, we had a case in Denver, uh, Colorado. It was a, a boyfriend and girlfriend and an infant child. The boyfriend and girlfriend were meth addicts. And the girl, the girlfriend um, supposedly was coming under possession. And there was one incident where she was in the bathtub and all of a sudden became super rigid and slipped under the water. And no matter what, it was almost impossible to get her out of the water. Now, they were terrified. But there's a good medical reason for that. When a person is rigid like that, they are much harder to pull up and to get out of the water or anything. And um, they needed treatment, drug treatment. Now, there, there was actual uh, phenomena as well. Uh, for instance, they were finding the baby in a different room or with lit candles in the crib. Um, that's terrifying. Of course, that's terrifying. And so we, we did what we, we could for them. But you must deal with the, the elephant in the room, and that's the drug addiction. In your experience, do you believe that paralyzed dreams are always demonic attacks? Absolutely not. No, almost never. Almost never. Um, phantom mania or um, psychic paralysis or sleep paralysis um, is actually uh, a normal psychological phenomena that does happen to most people. Having said that, uh, it can also be paranormal. It can be. Uh, it's only ever happened to me in hauntings. It's never happened anywhere else. Um, and the best way to deal with that, inside of your head, because you're not going to be able to talk, you want to surround yourself with the white light, which we call either the Christ light or the white light, um, the light of God. And you say inside your head, I command you, by the power of God, I command you to be gone. And you say that again and again and again until you're able to break free of its uh, hold. But often uh, th this is just psychological. Even when you see that shadow person looming over you and everything else, that's actually been shown in hundreds of thousands of cases to just be psychological most of the time. What exactly defines a witch and are there good witches? Of course there are. Uh, gee, am I the one that should answer that one? <laughs> I don't know. I want to hear your answer. No. <laughs> I think one of the things that bothers me the most is this misunderstanding about what witchcraft is. Witchcraft is uh, has roots that go back at least 35,000 years. It's probably one of the, the oldest religions ever. Uh, it started with hunter-gatherers who were learning about the mystical properties of the things that they had in nature. 
and also studying the stars and studying the environment and, and looking for mystical connections. You know, maybe n not all of it's real and not all of it is. For instance, um, the, the Romans and, and I think the Greeks too would study the flights of birds uh, to do discernment um, or the entrails of birds for discernment. Here's the thing, though. <clears throat> when you believe in it, then yes, the universe will reveal itself in the ways that you look for it. That's important. Um, one of the problems that um, I have with this blanket term witchcraft or witches, it's used here in Latin America everywhere. And a magic user is not a witch. A magic user is a magic user. Witches also use magic, but they are specialized. They are not just all magic users. Um, you know, they, they're all sorts of different religions that use ritual to focus energy. And that's what we call magic. Uh, I'm very uncomfortable with that particular um, word, magic. Uh, I'm, I'm more into quantum physics than I am magic. Um, but we have magic users and we have witches and we have others uh, in, in the foundation. And they use their abilities to help others. Mm -hmm. Don't equate witchcraft with Satanism. It's different. It isn't the same. And witchcraft isn't black magic per se. It can be white, red, green. And that's just in Mexico, for instance. Um, and then there's so many other forms of uh, magic use or mediumship or what have you that are extraordinary. And I, I've witnessed many of them throughout the world. Um, and they're, they're all different. Yeah. And, and then that leads me to bring up, we're going to be starting classes soon. And yes. the first class that I will be posting, because I almost have it done. I haven't told you about this yet, Chris, because it's, but it is a going to be a free class, actually, um, to get you guys to our site and to see all the different classes that we're going to be offering. And it's going to be a step-by-step, -step, um, almost like a how-to videos on how to make your own herbal bath bags or your own sage oil rolls to help you during investigation. So like I have, I call it an exorcism bag, but it's really just like an expel, get all the negative energy out from you. And I'm gonna explain all the different properties that the herbs and oils have that can help you as a paranormal investigator from my uh, kitchen witchery, as people like to call it. <laughs> yeah, you and I had actually discussed this and I think it's a beautiful idea. And I just did a, uh, God help us, four-hour course with Truckee College. Uh, if one four-hour class that got into the paranormal and used my grandparents' movies as a springboard to talk about all these different topics. And what I learned was, yeah, one four-hour class is a terrible idea. Uh, <laughs> You got to break it up into <laughs> a whole bunch time. of classes. There, there, yeah, four hours was certainly not enough time. Plus, it's crazy. I mean, th we can go into so much, and we're going to for you. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things, one of my goals with these classes, because so many people want to join the foundation and they're not ready yet, is take the courses that we think are important for your understanding because those are the places that you've got weaknesses. You don't have to take everything. Um, and then afterward, we'll see whether or not you're still, if, if you're a good fit for the foundation. I will never make that promise. I'm not going to say take our courses and you can join the foundation. No way. Um, but it'll give you something. Mm -hmm. I really want to start teaching people. And even if you don't join the foundation, which, by the way, is free to join. Um, even if you don't join the foundation, if I can give you good tools to empower yourself and to help others, absolutely, I want to do that. And then I'm just going to answer one quick question. Sorry, guys, if I'm a little bit behind on questions. We had way more than I thought we would. So I'm actually, we're answering questions back from 930. <laughs> And one question that was asked is someone wants to know what my um, field is in. And I actually have a PhD in metaphysical science and humanistic studies. 
So that's kind of what that is with an emphasis in parapsychology. Yeah, it's pretty cool. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I I was excited when I got that. And I'm trying to scroll. And if we don't get to your questions, um, don't worry, we will be back live in two weeks. And next time we're live, we will be discussing some of the cases that your grandparents did that you went on with them. But we will be available Mm -hmm. to answer more questions at that time as well. So. Yeah, I apologize. My my uh, computer is terrible. Even though I'm trying to scroll, I hit I do that, and it takes two or three minutes before something goes anywhere. And, and Streamyard, I'm like all the way at the beginning, and if I scroll to the most recent comments, it only shows me a hundred comments. So anything that was done before the hundredth comment, I've lost. So I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah. Um, People, people ask some things about darkness. Um, I'm not afraid of the dark. I, I'm very comfortable in the dark. I like the dark now. Uh, the dark is just something people are afraid of because they can't see and that are, they feel more vulnerable. Uh, so it makes things much easier to manifest. But spirits are around you day or night. doesn't matter. It's just when there's a lot of energy, they can be drowned out it's easier for them to manifest in the dark Mm -hmm. Um, it because they they're showing up against nothing. It makes them much easier. I don't know if that helps, but. And then someone wants to know how would they initiate a case referral to the foundation? Well, that one I ask you to explain because this whole Google form thing that you've put together, (laughs) I still don't really understand. Yeah. Well, what we've done is we put together a Google form, which, I do still have up so I can put that in. I'm going to put it in the comments again real quick. Um, I had it in the comments earlier and I'm actually seeing people are. You can also go to help at warrenlegacy.com. That's the easy one. Yes. And unfortunately that will probably get you referred to the Google form. (laughs) Well, at least they (laughs) know how to find the Google form because that's the part I have trouble with. Help at warrenlegacy.com. Now warrenlegacy.com is our website. And then I just posted it and hopefully it'll post soon. But if you fill out the form or email us, we'll refer you to the form. And it basically asks what information you have about the case, um, what's happening, who's being affected, and um, just kind of details, like little background information. And once we have that, we will pass it off to a regional director that is in your area. And from there, the regional director will reach out to schedule a video interview and in some cases, we schedule a follow-up video video interview just to make sure, you know, after we hang up with you, we have other questions we think of after we're done. And then at that point in time, if we feel it needs an investigation, we'll reach out to our members that are in your area, and they will come out and do an investigation. When when we're luck, when we're able to have somebody close to you, that's exactly what we do. We're working on uh, different ways to uh, finance the foundation so that we can help teams actually move around the country or the world. Um, but right now, I'm on a social security budget, so uh, that's a little hard. But we're working on it. We are working on it, which is why we're doing the class. One of the reasons we're doing classes. One of the reasons we're doing the books. Uh, is to finance the foundation. And one question I've lost, but I know it was asked, is someone wanted to know how do we handle cases when we know that they're out for the Warren name? Thank you very much. Um, We're really not able to help you. (laughs) I don't play that. I am. I'm sorry. I'm I have (laughs) very, you know, people think I'm this really nice guy. I do not have patience for that kind of crap. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then do we have any support groups for team members who have had a case that ended in suicide? I'll I'll always be there to help any, anybody uh, who's dealing with something like that. It's something, um, grief counseling is one of the things we deal with a lot. How do you think the earth was created with energy? She just wants to know because she believes in the energies doesn't mean that she doesn't believe in God. That's right. Look, I struggled with my faith for the first 50 years of my life. I, 
you know, I was raised Catholic, but by the time I was 12, I knew I wasn't going to be Catholic. And I started letting the Mormons in. Then I let in the Jehovah Witnesses. Um, then it was Buddhism, Zen Buddhism. Uh, then it was uh, Hinduism. And uh, I, I lived in Muslim countries and studied their religion. And, you know, I went to Israel to, to study. Um And the one th thing I always envied was all of these people in their different religions and how how much they got from their faith, because I couldn't I couldn't feel that I didn't know why not, you know I believed in God but I I didn't feel, and I realized it was my own hubris, my own pride, getting in the way, it was my ego, I was trying to understand the mind of God now. There, there's uh, billions of galaxies. And according to NASA, there are more living worlds in the universe than there are grains of sand on Earth. All right. Now, if there's a creator, I'm supposed to understand the mind that can keep track of all of that? No, I'm sorry. That, that's pure pride on my part, egotism on my part. My faith came when I gave up my ego. And... I don't care if you think of God as a pink bunny rabbit. It doesn't matter. God doesn't care. You know, all that matter, all that matters as far as I can tell to God is that you're trying to get closer to God. And as long as you're doing that, you're going to get, you're going to get there eventually. Um, it's only the fool running around telling everybody they're going the wrong way that never gets close to God. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> what is the best way to help someone that you feel is in a state of obsession with the spirit? Uh, uh, oh, boy. See, this is where we're getting into um, what do you do if you think it's uh, brain cancer? Uh, <laughs> can I have a little more <laughs> information, please? <laughs> you know, um, that's just not enough. Mm -hmm. And it would be uh, irresponsible of me to to start giving a bunch of blanket advice for what is fundamentally different for each case. You must know a lot about the case. Having said that, there are there are certain things you can try. Um, for instance, uh, baptism is a minor form of exorcism that can wash away spiritual attachments. But if that person doesn't believe, and if that person isn't dedicated to it, doesn't doesn't embrace it, then it's just water. It's meaningless. It must come from them. It must come from their soul. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So education, free will, uh, dedication on their part, all of those are necessary. They have to want it. Tracy wants to know, she's studying neuropsychology. Do you think that would be helpful in this field for her as a psychic? Absolutely. Certainly. Yeah. Come see us. Hold on. <laughs> a lot of comments and okay. Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. How are you not afraid after fighting and winning a negative attachment? Faith. Um, it doesn't matter. I know I'm going to die. You know, I'll die. It doesn't matter how I die. It doesn't matter when I die. What matters is I know for a fact that my soul is fine. Um, not saved or anything silly like that. I don't, I don't think so. Um, I know God's got me. And I know that regardless of what happens to my body, my body is only the vehicle I drive, you know, my soul's fine. Uh, I just want to live while I'm alive. And I want to do as much good as I can. It's not about what I do for the individual. It's what I can do to elevate the spirit of the world, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to plant seeds to help 
so that when I'm gone, that good continues to grow. I'm not going to change the world, not by myself, but I, I, my goal is to help plant seeds so we all change the world. Does crema cremation prevent a soul from being able to reach out to another? No, not at all. Cremation only gets rid of the old car. It doesn't matter if you put the car in a compactor or a crematorium or in the ground. It's just a car. That's your body. You don't want your body. You want the places where you felt safe or you want a person or you want um, the place where you died. You may be stuck, mm -hmm. but you don't want your body. When people go to graveyards to do their EVP sessions, and if, please don't do that. Um, the only reason you're going to get something is because you're there and you're calling to the spirit. You're giving recognition to the spirit. So they come there because of you. They're not hanging out, uh, sitting on the gravestone, waiting for somebody to come by. No. <laughs> Yeah, and the one thing I've always thought is for cemeteries is if you're going to get in contact with anybody legitimately through an EVP session, it would be someone who's there because they're visiting a dead relative and that's where they were comfortable. Like I know there's that cemetery in Chicago where you have the woman sitting on the bench and there's been lots of reports of her just sitting there in front of a grave. Exactly. Yeah, I was just thinking about the white lady um, in Monroe, Connecticut. And the theory is that she's there because her baby is there and her baby was buried there so she feels drawn to there um that's why you know for her it was a place of comfort um that's her safe place her favorite place so you're not there to haunt your body you're there because it was something special to you in your life not in your death and do you believe in any religion do you follow the Catholic faith like your grandparents? I do not. I do not. I think that all religions have wisdom and pieces of truth. And you can learn a lot from them. But religion, religions are revelations that are shared and passed down from somebody who had received that revelation or many people and passed down as a set of beliefs that it's been then adulterated, shaped by others who came afterward. Um, whereas a spiritual uh, relationship comes from within. You don't need religion to have a spiritual relationship with God. It can bring you to a spiritual relationship, but it's not necessary. Uh, I am a minister, but I'm a minister without a religion. And Christy, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Like I said, I lost a lot of comments in my feed. But um, Ouija boards, what are your uh, thoughts? Yes. And <laughs> don't you have a lot of cases that started with the client using the Ouija board? Absolutely did. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are a lot of different ways we try to communicate with spirits. And I, they're all dangerous. Um, because all you're really doing is you're opening a door and even if you're saying hey grandma come here all you're really doing is shouting and drawing attention to yourself in through an open door and anything can come through there and if you're someone who happens to be very negative or disturbed in some way like for instance a teenager whose emotions are all very raw um you may attract something really dangerous the thing about a ouija board is it's like seances, uh, really. Those are the two things I can think of off the top of my head that are totally dedicated to spirit communication. Uh, tarot cards, not necessarily. Um, pendulums, not necessarily. Uh, many, you know, spirit boxes, yeah, okay, those two. They, they drive me crazy, too. Um, by the way, if you're going to do an EVP, use your friggin' cell phone. Do not go out and buy a $2,000 or $4,000 spirit box. Don't waste your money. If a spirit wants to communicate with you, they're going to do it because energy manipulation is the simplest thing they can do. Simplest thing in the world. And 
please do it in a passive way. Just turn it on and let it go. Do not try to communicate. Do not try to engage. Just see what you pick up. That's it. And don't obsess about it either. Don't try to ask follow-up questions. If it has something to share with you, it, then let it share it. But don't try to get more because then you're creating a spiritual attachment. And be careful because if it is negative, it's going to lie to you. I don't recommend spirit communication at all. At all. So um, I, what I just said about passive communication is for those people who aren't going to listen to me when I say don't do it at all. <laughs> Because believe me, I do know some wonderful people uh, who expose themselves to danger. And I also know that, at least my belief is, one of them who had done this ended up dying because they went into some place known for being negative. And while they were there, they got hurt by this thing. And three day, two or three days later, they were in a hospital and they were dead within a month. Uh, that's nothing to fool around with. Uh, right. Frustrates me that people don't learn that this is energy and energy can kill. Electricity kills. So why wouldn't this be able to? Right. Yeah. And for passive, passively doing EVP sessions, um, one suggestion you had said last week when I interviewed you was um, Kenneth Torres. He just puts it up and records and continues on just talking and sees what he picks up. One method I use, even though I'm still guilty of doing EVP sessions now and then, um, is I have a keychain that has a um, digital voice recorder on it. And when I go in on an investigation, the keychain's on my hip and turned on. So while we, and I get a lot of evidence on that just from us talking and getting a walkthrough of the property or something like that, I get more on that than I do during the EVP sessions. And, you know, most of our members use them. And I not necessarily these keychains, but I mean, uh, EVP sessions. I just don't. My grandfather did. He brought me into a graveyard to do it uh, when I was a kid. Um, man, and I had some weird field trips with my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you know, one time he had me and my, my, my friend spend the night at Highgate Cemetery in England. Uh Nothing there. He just liked the idea that we were going to spend the night freezing our asses off at Highgate Cemetery. He had a weird sense of humor. <laughs> uh, she wants to know if you keep in touch with um, any of your major demonic cases from the past to see how they're doing. We do uh, monitor them, on, but um, I've always made it... I, I prefer to help give them their tools, help them make sure they've got the support they need. And then I want to get out of the way because I don't want them dwelling on the, the negative and the, and the paranormal. I used to um, do more to follow up and to stay in touch for a long, long, long time. But um, I don't think it's uh, particularly a good idea. Um, as long as they know they can always come back, that's what's important to me. As long as that relationship is positive um, and supportive, that that's that's important. But that's that's as far as I like to go now. Plus, we work hundreds of cases at a time. Sometimes, I mean, not at a time, but you know, in a year, um, and I, that that's impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, I still haven't had dinner. What time is it? It's late. <laughs> What do you think happens when you die? You go back to where you came from. Hopefully a little closer to God. Maybe not. Uh, you know, I don't believe in hell. I believe, though, that we create something we could call hell. Um, sometimes the soul is so black, he can't, it can't get close to the light of God. So it's lost in the darkness. And that's a hellish thing. But it's a hell of their own making. And I believe, and just as my grandparents did, I believe in reincarnation. Um, I don't believe you go to hell if you're not baptized. Uh, I think that's a form of control of a state church. Um, having said that, I also believe in the power of baptism. 
uh, but it's with the consciousness. Uh, and when the baby is baptized, it's with somebody else promising to guide that child, to give them protection, um, which is an important step. Without it, it's just water. Um, did that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. And I know one question I saw earlier, but I lost it. I was trying to find it to get the exact details, but she was asking, she was basically saying that her daughter sees things and has experiences at a young age. What's the best way to help guide her? Like younger children. All people are psychic, everyone, and especially children. Um, but we teach them not to believe. And maybe that's not a bad thing uh, for most people. Sometimes when you start talking about it, you terrify them. And then they start manifesting things that are very negative. Uh, my son, as he was growing up, he was afraid of the dark a little bit for a short time. And I told him about our family ghost. We have a family ghost. Uh, who had told me when I was 21 that he would be with me the rest of my life, watching over me. His name's Harry Price. Uh, Google him, Harry Price. He was a ghost hunter in the 30s and 40s in England. And um, famous for Borley, Borley Rectory, Borley Church. Um, and my grandparents had a close connection with him. And we were up in Canada and in Halifax, and I came into the hotel room I was sharing with my grandparents. My grandfather came to the door and let me in. And he said, shh, there's a ghost in the room. I went, okay. Sat down on the bed in the dark as my grandmother is having a conversation with Harry Price. And I told my son about Harry. And I said, don't worry, Harry is there to protect us. He's there to watch over us. Don't be afraid of ghosts. They're just people. You know, most people are fine and good. Um, and even the ones that sometimes get out of hand, the ghosts, I mean, it's because they're lost and probably more frightened than you are because they don't know what they're dealing with. Um, the ones that knock on the door or take your keys and things like that, it's because they're trying to get a message across to you. They're trying to, to make contact with you. It's not a dangerous thing. It's not scary. It's nothing to be worried about. Um, and, and go with that understanding. Mm -hmm. and, and do that with your children. You know, minimize it. Minimize their fear. Uh, and remember that most uh, imaginary friends are imaginary friends. They're, they're not ghosts. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes they are. And we, we've had a lot of cases where they are. Um, but just because it's a shadow person doesn't mean it's a bad person. A shadow person is just an unformed ghost. And that's most ghosts. Most ghosts cannot manifest completely. Uh, shadows are the best they can, they can do. Do you think some sensitive shouldn't be in the field? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, if you've, if you've got depression, uh, anxiety, anything really, no, do not go in the field, you know, and this is true for our own members. I mean, we've got plenty of people who are fantastic and yet there are times when they should not be on cases because of what they're dealing with in their own lives. Um, you know, we all have difficult times. We all go through hard times things and when you're going through the hard things you do not go on a case because you're going to bring that with you no don't please keep in mind this is about serving others and it shouldn't be about you it shouldn't be about uh your ego mm -hmm. that's that's one of the things that drives me nuts is watching people i care about um people i've worked with and they get a little bit of fame and then all of a sudden they're not the same people anymore. The fame becomes more important than the work. And it, I'm, I, I'm happy I'm 57 years old because if 
this ever becomes something where I become famous. I think I'm at an age now where I can handle it. Mm -hmm. I hope. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that jackass who becomes an egotistical, self-centered jerk. Um, I always want it to be about helping others. Yeah, and we'll make sure you don't too. So I know I, I have a lot of good people around me to, to make sure of that. Yeah, and it, it's. I think what's really important to me is that I'm doing this with you and with others, uh, and we're going to see a lot of those others in coming weeks because it's important everybody understand that the foundation isn't the Chris McKinnell Foundation. Mm -hmm. It's a whole bunch of people working together. Yep. And our strength is in the fact that we come from different backgrounds and have different expertise. I'm not an expert. Nobody is an expert in this field. I know some great questions um, and maybe I've got a few answers, but the more I've learned, the less I know, the more questions I have. Yeah, and I know um, jumping off of that, we do have, I know you'll be joining next time in two weeks. But on November 3rd, we will actually have our regional directors on board for the Warren Files. So that way you guys can meet us, learn about uh, our no, I will, Wait, I will not be here oh. two weeks from tonight because I will be okay. uh, arriving in Columbia. That's right. So I will find someone to be with me next time <laughs> in two weeks. And we'll come up with another topic. But we will be here on the 20th. <laughs> so and we'll just and be, I, and I, I can be here later on. Week. But uh, yeah, in two weeks, uh, no, I'll be on my way to Columbia that day. Right. But throughout the different shows, we're going to have different topics, um, different training topics to help you guys learn better. We're also going to be bringing our members onto the show so that way you guys can learn why they joined the foundation and how their experiences with the foundation are. And just Q and A's like we're doing right now. So I'm trying to, I just lost that question. Someone wanted to know if you had ever had a dream about your grandparents and had they spoken to you? Yes, both. Um, <clears throat> Many times, actually. Um, I've been very blessed. The night my grandmother died, I was with her that whole day and that night as she passed. Um, and I wasn't sad. You know, I, that whole day, there were spirits in the room. And my grandfather was right there, and I knew it. And when she went, I said, Grammy, you still here? Yeah, a high-pitched wail. And I was like, okay, 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 you're here. <laughs> um, we had a virtual Christmas party this past year. And you were there, Heather. Um, yep. And my grandparents showed up. You know, I, I knew they were there all of a sudden. And I turned, and without saying a word, the medium I was sitting with looked at me and said, yeah, she just called you Christopher and said she's here. And I was like, yeah, yeah. That's what I needed to hear because I knew it. I, and then I had asked them to help me when I went to a sanitarium here. Um, and there was a, the ghost of a little child. And I was talking to the child in Spanish, trying to help the child to pass over. And the child was too afraid. And I called on my grandparents. And my grandmother came and she took the child and passed into the light with her. With, I think, him. It was hard to tell the child what the sex was. But um, they, they've shown up, uh, my grandmother has shown up in a couple of dreams, not my grandfather. Um, and they've shown up a couple of other times as well. Uh, so I, I've, I feel very close to them. It doesn't bother me, death anymore. I, I have been bothered by death in the past. It's put me into a de deep depression when I lost my fiance. But um, now I thank God because it's helped me to help others and it's helped me to understand that death uh adds meaning to life without it there's no immediacy there's no need to move forward because why bother we're not going to die anyway you know it doesn't matter if i work because i'm not going to starve to death you know uh i don't have to show love this year because you know a million years from now i can show it no with death there's regret. You didn't do the things you needed to do. Um, and it's funny. Uh, you'll find this when you talk to older people, much older people. Um, they don't regret what they did. They regret what they didn't do. So get out there and live. You know, don't don't be that zombie 
who goes to work every day and doesn't notice the 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 scent of the roses as they're driving you know really experience your life be part of your life every day and that actually brings up a question i have is i've talked to you several times about how my grandfather comes to me often but i've never seen my grandmother why mm -hmm. is it that you when you're close to people why is it you see one but not another because they choose to come back it's not up to you <laughs> it's their choice <laughs> and they don't have to come back maybe they've moved on maybe they've reincarnated you know uh maybe they're already back here in a human form again um so it's it, there, there there's free will after death too and mm -hmm. There could be a million reasons why one individual doesn't come around again. Okay. Yeah, because I think I saw questions about that too, about why some, and also why some people see it and others don't. You know, it's really important that actually that we talk about this for a second, that mm -hmm. it isn't healthy that spirits come back repeatedly uh, because then it, it loses meaning, you know, you should regret that you didn't tell somebody you love them while you had the chance because the whole point is get that lesson the lesson being don't do that again make sure you let the others in your life know you love them um and if they keep coming back well you know i don't really have to worry about it because i can tell you after you're dead you know mm -hmm. no make sure you tell them now we were talking about this earlier, how I'm about to leave Costa Rica and now everybody wants to see me. Uh, it's like it, it's it's like everybody be going to the funeral and talking about what a great guy he was, but they didn't see him for the past five years. You know, see the damn person while they're alive, will you? <laughs> um, and, and the truth is, why do some people see and others don't? Because some people are more sensitive than others more open to it than others. Even when you are totally open to it, you may not be sensitive enough to, to actually see them. Remember that when you're alive, you're going at a different speed than a spirit. A spirit's kind of like a pedestrian and you're uh, driving a race car. You're not paying a lot of attention to the pedestrians. You're paying attention to the other uh, cars. That's why when you do see ghosts, it's usually out of the corner of your eye. Mm -hmm. It's not part of your normal existence. I think I'm trying to scroll through the comments real quick here to see which ones I've missed. I know someone had asked, what are your thoughts of the Bible? I, you know, I'm really lucky. Uh, it started before college and then in college, I had this wonderful, a uh, set of courses taught by theologians and historians and liter uh, literary experts and historians. Uh, and I know a lot about the Bible. I've studied it myself and I, I've read it. And the truth is, there are many Bibles and they, they have different translations. And you can justify anything if you take the Bible and just use different passages. Um, but the Bible is written by man, not by God. Uh, maybe inspired, maybe divine wisdom. But for instance, there's one passage, suffer not a witch to live. That's a mistranslation. That is not what it originally said. It originally said, suffer not a poisoner to live. Different, completely different. Same thing um, with the whole thing about um, homosexuality being bad. It's actually about not laying with children. Not the same at all. Yeah, I think this might be one of our last questions. How does a person get rid of attachments? She says she knows she has one. Then you contact us and we'll help you. Mm -hmm. But. I'm not going to empower that idea without knowing a lot more information. Let us help you. Okay, you can do far more know, with your own psyche. You'd be amazed at the power that you have. 
And then the last question, I know you and I have talked about this. Um, do you believe your grandmother who said that St. Padre Pio interceded with, with her at Amityville? Yes, absolutely. I've got the photographic proof. Not only that, he showed up for me in um, the Haunted, the Schmerl case. Um, and I believe, I honestly believe he's shown up several other times. Um, I've had psychics tell me that he finds me very amusing and he likes to hang out with me occasionally. But I do know that he is one of the most active spirits in the world. He shows up all over the world helping people. When he died, he was like... Um, the caterpillar leaving its cocoon and becoming a butterfly. He's everywhere, helping people constantly. His mission has always been to help. And death did not stop that. If anything, it freed him to do more. And then I know Sarah, if you're, if I you're in trouble, I have no problem uh, in suggesting that you pray to Padre Pio. He is somebody that can help intercede with God. And then, again, like I said, I'll be posting the links on our page and in the comments again. But one last question is, how do we get mentors? I My suggestion would be they reach out to us and then we figure out how we can help them. Amen. Amen. And all of our information is scrolling on the bottom. You can find us on Facebook mm -hmm. and YouTube. And then our website is there as well. So I, I, I like Jen Sarabia's uh, hashtag Team Heather. <laughs> I'm, I'm Team Heather. Definitely. You guys are making me blush. Stop. <laughs> I, I'm just doing my job. I'm doing what you brought me on board to do. <laughs> and doing it brilliantly. No, thank you. Except for now you've thrown me off. Um, we will be back October 20th at 9 p.m. Eastern. Don't know what our topic will be. I'll have to figure <laughs> that out. So if there's any regional directors out there watching who wants to join me in two weeks, let me know. <laughs> hey, you know that, that Dalton guy has got a real sexy voice, I'm told. Maybe he'd be a good choice. <laughs> he's been on all night too, so he can't tell me that he's not. <laughs> I know, I saw that too. That's why I said it. <laughs> <laughs> so again, thank you everyone for joining us. And I do want to do one quick thing because Philip just made a comment that you could also go to Ghost Education 101. That's my other show that I do with Philip. Chris was on it with me last week. We have a yep. lot of great information. Next week, we are interviewing one of our regional directors. Kenneth Holden will be on with me. Um, same channel, same place. You'll see everything there. And also thank you, Philip, who is a foundation member. He did our intro and outro videos for our live presentations. So I really, really appreciate that because that video is not my strong suit. <laughs> so again, Unfortunately, I wasn't able to see it. Uh, it, oh, it froze on my end. Watch the replay. No, <laughs> I'm going to, I promise. Well, that part. I, I don't right. want to see me talking again. <laughs> Okay, so thank you guys, and we will see you in two weeks. You guys have a great night. God bless you all. Take care. Stay in the light. <laughs>